my name is uh, Sri Kalijarisa. I'm from uh, Tickling International, working with uh, Tickling International since last year. So today we are going to talk about uh, SAP system uh, migration to Amazon Cloud. So uh, this is a sample demo for for one single SAP system. We are you know going to see the process of the hands-on process uh, how to migrate the system to the cloud. About myself, in short, I have uh, 13 years of experience. Uh, I'm a senior technical architect. So I worked in SAP Business Consultant role, basically technical architect and uh, business consultant. This topic is like uh, we are going to see how to migrate an SAP system to Amazon Cloud. So uh, this is like a uh, summary of the picture of source system and target system. The source system is on the left side. The target system is on the right side. So uh, this is kind of giving you know, like a glimpse into what are the different layers of the source system. Uh, so the source system is a vanilla SAP NetWeaver sound software system. We will be you know, uh, migrating that system to uh, Amazon Cloud. The slide shows the architecture of it, you know, the source system, what we have. So this is going to be SAP NetWeaver sound five installed on uh, Linux operating system, SP12. That OS is running on VMware uh, hypervisor. And you know which like which eventually runs on the hardware. If if you go into the SAP application layer, so what we have inside this VM is the SAP NetWeaver installed on Oracle 12G 12G database, and the operating system is uh, Linux. Uh, so this virtual machine is you know divided into like its its data is actually split and uh, stored in different you know dot uh, VMDK files here as shown. So this whole VM is actually split into different uh, VMDK files. Uh, VMDK files, nothing but virtual machine uh, files. Uh, when we migrate this to the target environment, you know, we need to understand uh, the uh, target environment here. Uh, you know, so in this case, it's going to be the Amazon Cloud environment, and uh, so we are going to upload the SAP system to S3 first using a multi-part technology. So multi-part is like it's a parallel a parallel upload of the file. We use in a Python script to split the file, and then it's going to do the multi-part upload of all the split files, like you know seven eight files at the same time, and it's going to uh, join the files on the S3 again back to the you know original format. So once we get the files to the S3, we are going to create an uh, image out of the S3 file, and then from the image we are going to import into the actual EC2 instance. So here we have some components of the target environment. Uh, so that's one of the component is like the main component is the VPC, uh, VPC. So that's the virtual private cloud. So that's the default boundary of any network in the cloud. And we have like a uh, you know, default availability zone and AZ as a subnet. And in subnet, we have this uh, EC2 instance, which is the actual SAP system, which we're going to import and export uh, to the uh, cloud. That's about the target system architecture. In this slide, you know, this is showing the overall uh, workflow of migration. So system files, you see here, the .vmdk files, they, they are, you know, they are split into different uh, vmdk files. So these files will be uploaded to Amazon S3. S3 is nothing but the storage part of the Amazon Cloud. Uh, so we, we are going to use our own developed uh, Python script, which will, which will use the Boto library and uh, so it will do the multi-part upload of the file to the Amazon S3. Once the entire file is uploaded to Amazon S3, we are going to use the Amazon VM import uh, commands to, you know, change the form, convert it into an Amazon uh, machine image uh, format. Once it is in the uh, image format, we, uh, we are going to convert it into the actual EC2 instance and then we'll launch the instance and check the instance if we, if we have got the instance there or not. So yeah, so this is pretty much the overall uh, workflow. So now let's get into the hands-on part. So let's go and check the source system and see uh, what kind of source system we have. And, and from there, we can go forward. Okay. So here we have this uh, source system running on particular IP. Uh, uh, okay. So the source system is powered off. Let me power on, uh, power on the source system. So it's a VM. So SAP is running, on a, running inside a virtual machine here, putting up. Okay, so it has booted up. Linux VM has started. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find its IP address from here. Uh, sorry, uh, find its host name and ping. Okay, so I'm going to log in from Putty just to make it more clearer. So it's IP is 192.168. Four one oh one. 
Okay, so I logged into the virtual machine from Putty. So we want to make sure what SAP system is here and then, you know, can we, you know, like, is it in a working state or not before the migration? I think at this moment, uh, the SAP system is down. It's it is PRD. That's what I, uh, you know, that's what we named it. Uh, okay, so let me log in the Oracle side of the SAP system. So I'm going to start the listener. I see, the, you know, listener has started and going to start the Oracle database. So this is the standard method to start Oracle database. Okay, so we need to verify the status if Oracle is up or not. It's open. So it means it is started. It's good for the application to connect. So we're going to log into the SAP side of the application now. We are under the CDDM uh, user ID and, and we are going to do an R3 trans I fund D to check the connectivity to database if it is good. It's good. So four zeros means it's good. And we're going to start it. Start up. So it's going to start the SAP application server and then have SES and then the application server. Okay, so let me do a PS on the SAP process and make sure if it is started. Yeah, so all this DWD process are the SAP wants started. Let's go to Let's log in from the SAP GUI. So this is how I log in sometimes. No, it's more uh, C++. Okay. Yep, so I can log in. Uh, let me Okay, so this is, let's go and see what system is this. So this is SAP Net Fever system. 7.5 system, it's a vanilla that TOR is 7.5. It's running on Oracle 12 G database. Okay. Uh, uh, this VM is actually split into different files. So while creating the VM, so I choose the setting to, you know, store the data in more than one file. So that's why we have all these 34 files, 34 files of VMDK. So all these files are, you know, are having all the information of this VM. So they all belong to one virtual machine. That's what I, I wanted to highlight here. So when we want to export this SAP system, we have to you know, merge these files into single file, or even we can just move as it is, but end of the day, you know, the uh, on the Amazon Cloud, Amazon Cloud doesn't support more than 22 files. So we need to reduce either below 22 files or into a single file, and then move all of them to the Amazon Cloud, and from there we can convert it into the Amazon format. We are done with the verification of the source system. It is up and running. It is a SAP NetWeaver 7.5 with Oracle 12G running on it. So before migration, we need to start, shut down the system. We, uh, we want a very clean slate of the system. Stop step is going to stop the system. So it tries to stop the database. Let's say if it is, it can stop the database. If not, we have to stop manually the database. There is also a different method to migrate the database from, you know, the source to the, uh, you know, uh, from from the on-premise to the cloud. We can use the Oracle uh, transportable uh, table spaces concept. The same database can be moved to a different cloud system by using the Oracle uh, transportable table spaces. So in this demo, we are going to use the Amazon uh, multi-part upload and then, you know, uh, converting into an Amazon image format and from there to the EC2 format. So SAP is shut down. Uh, so we'll just make sure that the database is down. Uh, database is also down. Let's see. Yes, I think the database and the SAP are down. So these are like some SAP control processes. That's okay. They are killing these or stopping them abruptly. There is no harm. So SAP is down. So we can shut down the VM now. I'm going to log out from here. So I'm going to go to the VM. Close and then power off. So VM is shut down. So go to the file menu here and do an export to OEF format. So this format is supported by many target systems like Amazon or you know Azure, where uh, you know this format understood by all the cloud technologies. What this does is so it's going to export the whole VM into a single file which is cloud compatible format. Rename this as cloud or something. Cloud v one something, okay? And I'm going to export it to the fastest 
disk I have, that's the SSD disk, uh, which is an SSD, and I'm saying save. Okay, go. And we can see the export started. We'll see after 1% what files it creates. Yeah, I think it started exporting. And let's go to the D drive here. And it modified. Yes, this is the one. So it's slowly creating. So see, it's actually creating a file ending with VMDK, and the .emp will be gone once the whole file is exported. So the file extension is .vmdk, and the file size keeps on increasing. Uh, see that? Uh, see the size? It's 538,000 KB now. So that that means 500 MB approximately. And the size keeps on increasing, and that goes to like 34 gig because the whole VM size is 34 gig. So what's happening behind the scenes? Split files like uh, VMDK files of the original original source VM. All these files are being exported and being you know uh, merged into one single file. So it's like uh, one gig now. So it takes a lot of time. Generally, I think export is not that uh, you know slow. But it takes a while, so I already had a file which is exported here. So, he, so you see this, and you know the file ending underscore v1. So it is 30, 33 gig or 34 gig. So we can cancel this export in the meantime because we, I, I already had the file. So I just wanted to, you know, show, show the process of how to export this file. Uh, cancel. I'm going to delete this unnecessary file here. And okay, so from now onwards, we are going to concentrate on this one. Uh, so this one, you know. So this, so this is the file we just use the export method, and I already did the export uh, 34 gig just to save the time. Uh, so we are going to use our own Python script, which is developed in house here. We can use that script to upload that file. Uh, so I'm going to show the file, source code, you know, a little bit here. What it does is like you know if you if you see if you see the whole script like it has only hardly thirty lines that's it it's it's a very it's a, it's it's a very small script but it does a lot of intelligent uh, multi part upload in the background that that is possible because of the library Porto three Porto three is an you know an open source library uh, by open source community and it, it it is used for especially for Amazon operations this line here upload file. This is doing a lot of intelligent work in the background. So this single command, it's going to split this uh, 34 GB file, and it's going to upload them parallelly to, uh, to the S3 bucket of, of ours, and then merge all these files back into the origin format there. If you have to do that manually, you need to follow all these commands. And this is not just typing commands. It's like you need to split it manually, and you need to upload the file manually and wait for the file to complete before you know uploading the next part. So each part you have to upload manually to the cloud, and then you know this command, uh, complete multi-part upload, uh, needs to be run towards the end of it to complete the multi-part upload, and then you know like convert into image. So there is a lot of manual work that goes behind the scenes. So because of this Boto3 library. It, it actually makes the life simpler. So we were able to figure this out, and we have we have gone through the uh, public public license of this uh, Boto 3 and got it. And uh, this can be even extended to uploading multiple files. So and so today this is only a demo, and we are showing the single SAP system up, up, upload a single SAP system. Let's say if you're going to use this for like actual production usage, you have to you know extend this file to upload multiple SAP system VMDK files. Which actually belongs to different SAP systems, and this script you know, spawn you know, spawn multi-threading concept, you know, multi-threads in the background, and make parallel parallel process of different VMDK files. But it's going to hog the server resources, so you have to make sure that you know how many, like you know, what's the optimal parallel process that it can take at at, at the moment. So this is just, so I'm going to run the script now. Uh, sorry, not this. I think mostly, let's see what's over here. Yeah, so the upload has started. So this is a very nice feature. So we were not able, initially when we were writing the code, I'm I'm actually referring to the uh, progress of the uh, file. So the total size is 34 gigs, and now numbers changing are the ones 
currently uploaded uh, so the current size that has been uploaded so they it's being uploaded in parallel if we have to see that then i think we need to use like the process explorer or process highlight the window and uh, so you see all these threads here so the see on the top frame there's a powershell.exe that's highlighted and in the bottom you see all these threads so these threads are spawned by these by the script we are using so if if there are multiple threads these that means that these are the threads that are actually you know doing the actual multi part upload in the background so thread, for, for for seeing the threads you know you have to use a tool like this process explorer and look at the threads so it is doing a multi part upload so there are hardly 15 threads this is this is uh, decided automatically by the script or we can even configure that that's also there, but we can we can let the Boto library take care of this. I think it's doing a good job. Um, and then, okay, so this is how we upload. So so this is purely dependent on the bandwidth of your uh, on-premise uh, network. So some of the ways to upload in a system or migrate a large amount of database is that if you have like a dedicated uh, Amazon direct connect uh, backbone to the Amazon, that's that's one way. That's a little bit expensive way. There are other ways, like you can use the script you know, until unless the bandwidth is so you have very high bandwidth. Otherwise, you know, it's going to take a quite amount of time. Or else you can, uh, there is a service called Amazon Snowball. They're going to send like a big device, you know, to your uh, location. And you can just uh, copy all, all your, like, you know, all your enterprise data, SAP enterprise data to the disk and just ship it back to the Amazon. So that device is all secured, a uh, rugged device. So you, you can just uh, ship it back to Amazon and they're going to copy in the next day uh, in the, uh, to uh, to the S3 location you specify, and from there you can take it forward. But for uh, but for the demo purposes, or if you have like you know two three systems and you don't want any of the services to be expensive, to extra cost, so you can use this procedure to just upload the systems and get it done. I think uh, bandwidth. What I'm getting here is 35 Mbps. 35 Mbps. So which means maybe one two MB. Yeah, so it all depends on the bandwidth. So according to the band, the script is going to automatically detect and increase its speed and multi-part upload. I think the CPU is fine. It's only 25%. We still have surely 75%. So it's only the network. I already have uploaded a file onto our Amazon console uh, sitting in S3. S2 bucket TLI1. So this is the bucket name we, we uh, created here. So the file is getting uploaded to this test bucket. What happens to this is that you won't be able to see the file until all the files have been uploaded and merged. As you remember, right, as if you if you see the bare bottom process of you know, the, how the multi-part upload process is done, you cannot see the file, original file, because the original file is being split into different parts. So each time it, it actually creates an upload for each part. So let's say if this part, if this file is being created, like is split into each size is 50 MB, you know, like it's 34 gig by 50 MB. So there'll be easily, you know, 100 files there. The, the script is going to upload each part separately into the Amazon bucket. And then once all the parts are uploaded, then it's going to complete the up upload and merge all the files and show the file. So till then, we'll not be able to see the file there in Amazon. So the, that's a point to note, and you know, don't worry that it's not getting uploaded. It's, so the only way is to use the script, and there are some Amazon commands to know whether what's going on. That's using this command. If you use the AWS S3 API list parts, that's going to show how many parts are in the background getting uploaded. Once this process is complete, once this process upload process is complete, then we can see the file here. We I already uploaded a file, you know, a similar file, same file. And this is the one, it's 32 GB here. Going back to the presentation, just to get the catch of the workflow here. So after uploading to S3, so the second step is to convert the S3 VMDK file, you know, the VM or the VM file in the S3 storage to the Amazon uh, machine image format. We can, uh, you know, convert that into the Amazon uh, machine image. To do that, you need to use this command. It's called Amazon EC2 import image description. It will try to convert the VMDK file into the Amazon uh, machine image format. And once the file file is converted into Amazon uh, machine image format, you can move to any region you would like from there. Currently, we are in the you know, US East region. 
Amazon being a cloud service provider, right? you can take your files to any region and host your systems on any region. So you have all these regions right now, US East, West, and then Asia Pacific, Canada, Europe, Frankfurt, Ireland, and all these things. You may upload a location which is uh, near to you, and from there you can copy to a different region and then host your system. Uh, that's the advantage. So let's go with converting. Uh, I think we can end this upload file, but okay, let it, let it go, no harm. No Amazon uh, import image command to convert the uh, VMDK file to Amazon machine image as an input, which has like uh, has a as an input file, which is like a JSON format. So the JSON format contains list of all uh, VMDK files that, that needs to be considered for converting the VMDK file to the Amazon uh, machine image format. So in this case, we have only one VMDK file, which which has you know which contains which contains the data of all uh, 34 uh, VMDK files from the source system. So because we exported it to one single file, you know that makes our life easier. I don't need all these entries here because they they are all pointing to different disks. Uh, just in case if you if your source system more than one disk. Remember, Amazon supports only 22 disks at one point. So if your VM has more than 22 disks, you need to you need to reduce or change the format of the source system to less than 22 disks. So in our case, I just changed it to one disk, right? one VMDK file. I'm going to uh, name this as disk one. It doesn't matter what name you give. Format is VMDK. The, the bucket name is test bucket TLI one, which makes sure this matches the bucket name what you have on Amazon. S3 key is the actual file name on the Amazon S3 bucket. So I'm going to use this file name and you know put it here just to make sure this is the right name. Yeah. Save. Okay. So I edited the containers.json file in the JSON format. So this is the JSON format. So I just gave all these data in JSON format. So I'm going to run this run. We we we, we can open up a different shell so i'm going to open up the amazon uh, powershell say it's a standard windows powershell with uh, amazon uh, uh, command line uh, libraries installed so i'm going to change my directory to the one where i have all the files and then run this command sap test vm is the name of the vmi I'm going to give and this license type. You see this license type argument. So that we, we are going to use our own license. That's what the, the BYOL says. If you want to use the standard AWS license, you can just say AWS. But in this case, I'm going to just say BYOL. Okay, so we are going to start this process. There are some prerequisites for this process to begin and complete successfully. So Amazon is going to check all those prerequisites before starting the conversion process. So it just comes back saying that it's pending here. It's pending. So this command is not like a synchronous one. It actually comes out of the uh, execution, and the execution happens in the background. We have to use different command to know what's happening there. The AMI ID is this. This is the AMI ID here. So you can say FFU XG GI. And this gives the status of what's going on in Amazon. This number here you see here, number two, number seven. So this is the percentage completed. Previous status was pending, and the actual status is validated, active and validated. So the only way is to just keep on running this command. So it's 28% done, completed. That's good. So that's a good sign. There will be particular percentages from where at points where it takes a lot of time to move from that point. So just don't be worried or you know, don't be panicked. Just give it some time, at least you know, 10 to 15 minutes of time is very, uh, very important. Be patient. If it fails, it will show that it will fail. So as as long as you've seen it's converting, it's good. But as otherwise, you know, it, it should not take more than like maybe at the max 20 minutes. That's the worst case scenario. If it's taking more than that, then there definitely there's an issue. So we are using the Amazon EC2 describe import image task. That's the actual uh, com uh, subcommand, and the import task ID, the uh, AMI ID. Okay, it's 28 percent. I think this is where it took a little bit time to move forward. Most of the conversion happens at this uh, at this point.
So let's see if it if it gets com- or completed or not. So it's 28 percent. I think it's going to take some time here, maybe five more minutes. It actually gets turned into the Amazon uh, machine machine image format. There is a machine image format which I converted using the same process. So you can go to machine images like going to EC2. If you go to EC2, you can see the Amazon machine image. Yeah, so this was a machine image imported earlier using the same process. So it's see, it's, it's with the AMI ID. So that command was able to convert the VMDK file into the Amazon machine image format. Using this machine image, you, yeah, you can actually put this machine image, uh, machine image into SAP like Amazon Marketplace or just keep it private also. As of now, the visibility is private, so nobody in the marketplace is able to see your machine image. Just select this, you can launch an EC2 instance from here. So when launching the EC2 instance, right, you are the one who knows the capacity of the target in the source system. So the source system was like eight core and uh, 32 GB memory uh, system here. So we can select something near, otherwise, you know, you have problems starting, right? So, so I'm going to select this one, you know, T2, 2X large capacity type, which has eight CPUs and 32 GB memory. And I'm saying next. So we are launching an EC2 instance from the converted EMI image. We want one instance of this default VPC. VPC is the default boundary on you know, the network boundary of our network in this region. So it's asking which subnet you want to assign. No preference, use the default subnet. It doesn't matter for now. But when you're planning for uh, production, you may want to specify the default subnet which you know in which you you want the system uh, hosted hosted in. Auto assign public IP enable. We want to access the system from our network to the cloud. For now, we need public IP. Generally, I don't think it is advisable to enable public IP, but for demo purposes, it's okay. Or for you know some sandbox systems or test systems, that, that's fine. And IAM role. There's no security as of now. I'm the only user who's going to access the system. Shutdown behavior, when I when I choose stop, say stop. And this is going to run on a shared hardware instance under the cloud. In the cloud, we do not have uh, you know visibility of what hardware they're going to run the system on. And, and they give us two options like this here, dedicated and shared. Let's say shared, dedicated costs more. And next storage. The storage, it has automatically converted all the disks here, a total disk, uh, VMDK files of 150 GB, total 34 files, 150 GB, into a single file system. Now we should change that layout later once we start the system. But for now, it has automatically detected that it needs 150 or above. So I'm good with the default recommendation. And uh, this is the disk type. So this is good, this is okay. I don't want to tag anything later. Conflict of security group. So security group is something, this is the point where you can mention what traffic should come in and what traffic should go out. So the inbound outbound traffic is actually defined here in this case. It's not like you only you know SSH to the system, but you want access from SABWI as well, right? So for now I'm saying all traffic. This is not uh, recommended for a production system. Uh, production system, you have to specify particular TCP ports like this, you know, custom TCP rule and you go and give SSH SAP dispatch report number and everything. Let's say if, if, if the system's instance number is 00, you give 3200. So you allow inbound and outbound rules and you define them here. For demo purpose, I'm going to say everything. Allow from anywhere. It's a warning. The security group launched Wizard 2 is open to the world. Yes, it is open. So this is a key pair. You can use existing key pair or you can create a new key pair. Remember you, once you create the key pair, it is not available in the cloud anymore. It is downloaded to your computer. If you lost the key, you cannot access the system. There is no way you can access the system, it's gone. So this is like a key, but there is no way to create a duplicate key. Uh, you know, I have never faced a situation where I, I lost the key, but just in case you lost the key, you have to contact Amazon support. I have a key here, so I'm going to use the same key, but that doesn't mean that Amazon has the key. I have the key in my desktop, you know, like in my machine stored in a safe location. Okay, and your instances launch. That's good. Okay, so it is spinning up another instance. I'll give it a few minutes for it to complete. So in the meantime, you can check what's happening with the EMI process we started. 
to 28 percent. Indeed, it takes time here for the conversion because this is the actual conversion phase. It may last for 10 minutes even. The instance is running, but we cannot access it because the status text, the status under the status text column, that should be green. If you select this right, if you select this and just go to the details, you will see there are two IPs, public IP and private IP. So we need the public IP to access the system. You can try accessing the system from public IP if it is if it is you know accessible or not. So I'm going to use the party here. So it started. Generally, if it is a standard Amazon EC2 instance, the status text should be green before I log in. This is good. Uh, doubt if I have all the disks here. I think it's all available right now. Okay, that's good. So I logged in with my root account. So this is the root account on the source system. So this is not a root account that's being provided by Amazon. Amazon will never provide root access. The standard login is EC2 hyphen user, and which can be logged in only with the key, because this is our custom VM. We actually try to migrate to Amazon. None of the standard Amazon login mechanisms are working by default. We have to change it or adapt the system to the Amazon login mechanism. Uh, and we have to set up this key. Make sure the systems are accessible only by using the standard key. I'm going to do some network changes because I'm, I'm going to log into the SAP account, PRD ADM, do a CD Pro that changes the directory to profiles, SAP profiles. And you see here, all the SAP profiles are tied associated with this host name called VM Linux One. And the current host name is something different. This is totally different one. Amazon is trying to change the default naming convention of the machine to its own naming convention. So SAP system will not start if you start by default on this. So change the system to back to the original settings. So I'm going to, so I'm going to root account or try to use an account which has the root permissions or you can ask the uh, Unix team, use the STYAST command. This, this is our central management console of the Linux operating system we use this so go to net system and then network settings go to host name so this is a little bit of clumsy here but you you need to understand this is how it works here i'm going to change this name to vm linux one remove this uh, check mark change host name via dhcp if this is not removed while rebooting the this uh, ec2 instance it's going to contact the amazon dhcp and get the host name back again it, it's own its own host name then, then the one what we have configured. So we change this, uncheck this, enter the you know the right host name what we wanted. That's the host name on the source system. Okay, I think that's it. It's going to activate. It tries to activate the network services with the changed configuration. I think this host host file is coming from the source system directly. So we will remove the IPv6 addresses which we don't need. We don't need any of the IPv6. None of the SAP systems use IPv6. Okay. So it's still not reachable. We need to assign local IP what we see on the Amazon console here. This is the local IP. We can say VM Linux one, and we can reboot the instance. So I'm going to exit from it, actions and instance state, and reboot. So we'll see what happens. The process, AMI process here. Meantime, yeah. So the status checks change. That's because it is rebooting. So let the status check come back to the green. Then we 
me to log in and check the host name is fixed. There are some things here to remember because the source and the target operating system are the same. That's why Oracle files, did, I hope we will not have any problem when starting the Oracle database. If the source and target operating systems are different, then Oracle cannot be migrated just as it is. You may have to use the Oracle, you know, uh, transportable uh, table space concept, migrate the Oracle files. In the regular enterprise system, real production systems, uh, not all not all the VMDK files will be available in, in a single VM. Uh, most of them come from the data stores of the VMware uh, ESX hypervisor. So in that case, uh, you only migrate the actual uh, Linux bootable VMDK files and then the rest of the ones, they have to be unmounted and that data has to be copied over to S3 manually and then brought into the actual EC2 instance by just copying them back into the volumes as volumes and then mounting them as volumes. It's a bit different process when, uh, when you compare it to the actual production and when your system data in a different data store. I'm just waiting for the checks to turn up, turn up green. I think I did reboot two times. That's I think that's the reason it's been a long time. Okay, so the host name, so the prompt, you know, the host name on the prompt changed. Uh, Okay, good. So I'm able to ping the host name using the original host name, right? So that's good. So and it is giving me the 172.31 ending with 118, which is the private IP signed by the Amazon uh, cloud. So which is good. So I think uh, we are in a good state to start the systems. Let's go uh, to the Oracle account on the VM and let's start the listener, this database listener. This needs to be started before we start anything. Yeah, the command completed successfully. So the listener has started. And let me start the database manually. This can be even started from start the command, but I just always want to make sure that I'm, I'm, I'm just more comfortable doing this way because I want to make sure there is no mess going on the database side. Okay, so it's ideal instance, no instance has been started. We're going to do a startup. So these are all the SG, this is this is the total HDX call system global area. And all these all these components you know beneath it are the actual components of the system global area. So database mounted. And the next phase is open. Okay, good. So what I do is just a status from some view, with all instance. Okay, open. Database is open for application to connect. Uh, so going back to root ID and logging into the SAP ADM account. I'm going to use the R3 trans iPhone D to check the connectivity to database from application side before starting SAP. Should return all four zeros, which means success. Yeah, that's good. And I'm going to start just do a start chat. So it checks whether the database is running at the beginning and then just goes forward to start the rest of the components of the application server and message server. Okay, so we can get ready. So it looks like it started. I'm going to do a grep and see. These are the SAP processes here. Before even logging in, I can make sure. So I use this, you know, dpmon command. It's the dispatcher monitoring command, and do an L, an L here. This is the SAP work process. I think this is getting started. So I'll see only active process. Uh, so I'm going to trace files and see what's going on. I think it's all good, but I just want to make sure. And it's good. Let me then connect from the public IP. It takes this, to take this one, sub V, and then zero, zero. Let's see, I'm able to connect to the SAP system on the cloud that we just migrated. We use the same passwords on the source system. That's it. There is 
they did not even ask me for license change. It's a surprise. So because it's a VM, and they know the all the license was intact. It's a it's a bit a surprise for me. I thought it would ask ask for a new license, but so that's good. So if I go to S license, so I think uh, it does compiling because it actually detected the underlying infrastructure as a different architecture, and it starts to compile every piece of the program. So I think the best way, you know, the best step is to run the S S gen so that everything is compiled in one shot before you hand over the system. License is good and. And just do a, a transaction called SICK, which is the SAP consistency check. No errors reported. I think we're good. And uh, let's go to the status and just make sure we are on the cloud. So we are on the same SAP NetView 7.5, uh, Oracle Database 12G. And if you want, it's on, you know, the host name of the Linux is VM Linux 1. And then the IP address. Is 172 31 37 118, which matches with uh, sorry, this is the local IP. This is the local IP, but we connected from you know the SAP GUI using the public IP. I think it's good that uh, yeah, the system is migrated to cloud and it's running act healthy on the cloud. I think with that, I think we have come to an end. Uh, you know, thank you for your time. Today we have gone through the process of migrating one single SAP system from on-premise to cloud using our own scripts. We have not used any any expensive tools in the market. So they are like tools which uh, you know which are priced at like per system they will charge uh, five hundred dollars or one thousand dollars somewhere around that to migrate each and every SAP system. If you have fifty or hundred systems, you can go that way. But uh, this everyone should know. You know. What are the basics behind you know moving an SAP system to the cloud? You can contact Jim for any, any more information, or like if you have any technical information, you can uh, you can send me an email. So we'll be able to help you. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day.